let's give everyone a few minutes. So let's let's plan to start for like 10 minutes after 10, no later than that. Give everyone a few minutes to get on board. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Julian. Yes. Graciela here. So Leah and I would be making a presentation yes, so that we can go. Okay. So we can go through the uh, same things that we sent to everyone. Okay. Finish up the connections. The last you there for a minute. Are you there? Yes. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay, so I was saying that Leah and I will be making the presentation. I'll be making the presentation. We have the Excel file live so that we can fill it out as we go. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Ruth. Hi, good morning, Miguel. You don't sound that enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh, okay, okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> Yeah, morning, Ruth. Um, you should be all excited. You're going on vacation tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. You should be loving to get on that plane. Um, that's like mixed emotions, you know. All it's gonna take is for one person to cough, and you know, I'm gonna be like, oh no. Um. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. I mean, I've never driven across the United States, so. Christina. Good morning, Ruth. Okay. Um, I'm finishing Julian's interview. I'm typing all the stuff up now. Um, and I'll send it to you probably early this afternoon, okay? Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. And thanks to Julian also. Thank you.
I'm doing an audio check. I'm coming from Marcos. Maria, can you hear us? We are silence waiting about 10 minutes so everyone can log in. Good morning. Yes, we can hear you. Good Perfect. morning. Thanks. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, hello, Lance Monum for the record. Um, I had a little trouble logging on, but I believe I am on, if somebody could confirm. Um, I just heard everybody say good morning, but now there is silence. Yeah, you are in. 
Good morning, morning. Lance. We're good. good morning, Lance. We're going to do a roll call here very shortly. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Okay, good morning, everyone. It is April 19, 2021. It's 10, 10 a.m. I would like to call the DAP meeting for St. Thomas, St. John District Water. Um, can we do a roll call, please? Uh, Julian, um, on the list we have Graciela Garcia, Lijay Rivera, uh, Julia Magras, Lance Armstrong, Carlo Fachete, Colin, as it is, Cory Magras, Cristina Lan, David Ortiz, Tena Martino, Gilbert Levan, Iris Oliveras, Madeleine Gujan, Maria Lopez, Mercer, Nicole Grill. Ruth Gomez, Sarah Stevenson, Winston. I guess this is Winston Levy. Okay. Um, I have a couple of members that were asked to be excused today because of last minute um, issues. We have Daryl Bryan that's going to be excused today. Elizabeth Caddison, who is off island and couldn't get to call into the meeting. Joshua Borg from St. John. Also um, has asked to be excused and Gregory Lede also asked to be excused. Um, I have one of the members supposed to be joining shortly. So um, I guess we're gonna have to move forward with who we have today. Um, after this meeting, I'm putting on a record that I will be um, 
revisiting the members and speaking to them all individually and ensuring that they all still want to be part of this committee because it's very important that we have a working committee so we can move forward with the, the agenda items um, representing all areas of the fishery. So also one other um, item I'd like to put on the record um, for those members who are participating today, we need your input. We need everyone to speak up when the opportunity arises um, after presentations or during presentations to bring your point across. So please everyone, I need your participation. With that said, um, Miguel, um, we can start with the first presentation. Okay, just for the record, uh, if Nicole Grill is representing the DPNR, we have a quorum. So, for Madeline. Madeline, Madeline Guantes is, is, is there also. Yes. Uh, good, mo good morning. Uh, this is Winston Lede. I'm present. Okay. Yeah, yes, thank we you. got you, Winston. Okay. And good morning. This is Lance Monum, present. Thank you. All right, so for the record, we do have a quorum to move forward. Yes. Good morning, David Ortiz, present. Okay. Uh, Graciela will, will run the meeting today. And just to dispose of it easy, we only have two agenda items for today, the island base of MPs and the, and the ecosystem model. We were hoping that the island base of MP will be advanced by this time but I've received uh, communication from Maria de Mara. Also, I talked to Andy Sturcek, the, the regional administrator, uh, pro tem. And we have delays because of COVID, as you all know. So we are expecting that the plan might be, that those three plans might be implemented in 2021. But at this time, it's a, it's a working process. What I would like for the group is to start thinking about possible modification. For example, last summer, you indicated that you would like to look at compatible, possible compatible regulations between the St. Thomas jurisdiction and the federal jurisdiction in relation to the island based FMPs. But just think about it, you don't have to, to go through it now if you don't want to. And with that, Mr. Chairman, we will allow Graciela to, to start the discussion and presentation. All right, sounds great. Graciela, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And first of all, let's see, are you seeing the PowerPoint presentation or are we still seeing the uh, Federal Register? We're seeing the Federal Register. seeing the Federal Register. There we go. Muy bien. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first of all, thank you very much for all the contributions that the St. Thomas uh, DAP has had regarding the ecosystem conceptual model that you have uh, put forth. I have to begin by saying that we have reviewed all of the notes and all of the video from all the meetings that we have uh, held with the St. Thomas uh, DAP, St. Thomas St. John DAP. So I'll be presenting a short, brief uh, summary, but the the and you all know the history of the development of the ecosystem uh, conceptual models. So basically today's task, we have to finish the, uh, uh, the ecosystem conceptual model. That's our main task today. We want to fin finalize what it's missing from the uh, ECM. We want to make sure that we've captured all of the connections that you have put forth. And if there is something missing to please let us know uh, and we can include it at this stage. Okay, because this would be the last time that you see it in this format. We'll show you some of the scoring that uh, has taken place regarding the uh, information that you have provided to us. Sure. And then, excuse me, everything okay? Okay, so let's begin. And we have a little timeline history of what you've uh, done. So the uh, first joint meeting that we held was March of 2019. It was a joint meeting of all the DAPs and the SSC. And then everyone just uh, 
put down everything that they thought was important, what drivers were important to what component that was affected in the ecosystem, because the idea was to know what everyone understood in terms of, the, of their own uh, ecosystem. So we held that meeting, then another one in June. At that time, this is what your, your uh, model looked like. And I have to make a statement here. You have seen the visualization of your model in different formats, but mental model, it's really the only one that offers you the, the capability of looking at the uh, matrix of being able to score what you think uh, it's a positive connection, what you think it's a very strong connection, etc. So this is really what the mental model modeler looks like. So at that meeting, you had already made a, we, we were up to 93 connections in terms of everything that you had put forth. You have 35 connections that were still missing a, the, uh, whether they were positive or negative a, impacts and how strong that impact was, but it was a, a finished, almost finished. So the next meeting that we hosted was in um, August last year. And at that time, the DAP had put forth 11 top key items, and those are shown here in pink in the uh, documents that you have received. You're able to uh, look at them closer in the screen, but these are all listed here. So you had provided <clears throat> these very important key elements that have a direct impact on the uh, ecosystem in St. Thomas, St. John that that uh, you consider were the most significant ones. So I'm going to read this for the record because these are very important and it will bear into the uh, information that we need to complete today. So enforcement, water quality, education and outreach, heritage and culture, natural disaster response, socioeconomic impacts, essential fish habitats, land-based sources of pollution, coastal management, coral diseases, and large vessel impact. Okay, so I'm just pointing out that these are the main topics that you had um, requested or put forth in terms of the ecosystem. And when you see all these lines and you'll see more, and these are the ones that we're going to finish today, the ones that have the question mark, like right here, uh, you'll see how this all comes together, okay? So the updated connections that we need to look at uh, today. So everything that you see in blue, it's a positive uh, impact from the driver to the component that it's affecting. Uh -huh. The brown lines are a negative impact from the driver to the component that it's affecting. And then we have all these question marks that you may decide to uh, score today, or you may decide to remove them. In the case of St. Thomas, uh, you've done a consensus statement. So your scores are based on the number of participants that agree uh, when we have gone through all these uh, connections. And that's the way that uh, it's expected to be done today. If anyone has any specific opposition to uh, anything that it's uh, all the connections that we're going to show, to please come forth and say it because that we also take into consideration. Lia Hai uh, Rivera will be intervening with the, with the uh, presentation because we will be going through the uh, comments that you've already made to make sure that uh, from those connections that are missing, we have the information that we need, the rationale to connect the, uh, the dots. Okay, <clears throat> so briefly we have six missing boxes that were just loose in the uh, in the model. So we were trying to figure out what you wanted to do with strong winds, ground swells, heavy rain, beaches, natural filters, and state government DPNR. And what we've done is that we have access to the Excel file so we can go through them and you can tell if, if this is the driving component, what's the affected component. If you want to put strong winds, ground swells, heavy rain into a weather and then if all the affected components are the same then you can let us uh, know that we need to know if that's a positive or a negative a uh, driver component connection <clears throat> and your score 
So these are the things that we used uh, and you saw in the email that we sent that we give it a 0.5, 0.25, 0 0.5 and 0.75. This is just a basic score so that we know uh, uh, what the average is for that uh, pair. And then we also use the number of participants. So it's very important that we know that everyone that it's in the uh, in the call today, in the webinar today, in the uh, meeting today, it's uh, in accordance with what you'll be uh, deciding. So in addition to those six loose boxes that we found in, in the uh, uh, meetings that you've held, in the summary from the meetings that you've held, we also have a 29 pending connections. So Leah Heiss put them in green here so that you can see what they are. You do have, you know, a whole bunch of connections. It's a total of 127 connections, but you've already as a DAP, St. Thomas, St. John have locked into the 11 key components. Once we score everything, then we'll know if what you have selected is exactly the same as what the scoring is. And if not, then we'll increase the number of key components to make sure that everything that you consider important and the scores tell us that our uh, important connections are not missed. This does not mean that we're not going to look at all the 127 connections eventually with all the other groups that are looking at the um, to develop ecosystem conceptual models to present to the council. And the other groups are other commercial fishers, for example, that do not participate in the council uh, meetings regularly, or recreational fishers, NGOs, academicians, et cetera. So there are a number of groups, you know, the Science Center, the LENFEST are looking at different, at other groups that will be creating a, a ecosystem conceptual models. So the idea is then to look across all of the uh, conceptual models and determine what what are the most significant uh, driver component connections that people are uh, thinking about when they think about the marine ecosystem? Okay, so I will have the Excel file up in a second to look at the driving component, affected component connections that were missing. These question marks are the reflection of what you saw in the model. So you have things like ballast water, closed areas, coastal development, lithium, ion batteries. And these are things that were mentioned in your previous meetings, but for which we don't have a, a connection. So we would like to complete these, or, or you can delete them if you want, or if you need to add anything to these, we need to look at, at these 29 connections to make sure that we have everything that you've talked about throughout your meetings. So, Finally, you've also had the uh, fisheries model that you've created most of that in terms of the regulatory agencies. So to, to date, we have not been able to uh, uh, look at those regulatory agencies or to have them at the table, uh, as you know, but still you've gone through the exercise of doing this. So we have some connections that you've already established, but we also have some question marks here that we would a, like to fill in if you would like to do that. And if not, we can just leave it pending. You tell us what you want to do in that sense. So this is the, uh, f the specific fisheries model connections that you have a, left. So we can come back to this also at the end because this will be trickling from the very expansive ecosystem conceptual model to the very specific fisheries model for the Virgin, for the St. Thomas, St. John area. Okay. And I think that that's my presentation, Mr. Chair. We'll move into the Excel uh, file unless anyone has any questions for us. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you for the presentation, Graciela. So everyone understands this is where we left off. I know it's been a while, um, but I guess we're here today to try to finish complete this so we can move forward. So uh, from what I understand, Graciela, the next step is to start to fill in the boxes. Hey, that is correct. So remember, uh, we and Leahai will be uh, 
uh, reading for us if there are any specific comments that you have made but from which we could not deduct what the connection was. So we'll be filling in these blanks. So there was a lot of mention about ballast water and the and impacting essential fish habitat. So, I mean, we can infer from what we know, but it's better if the DAP St. Thomas St. John makes that statement, whether it's a positive or a negative impact on the essential fish habitats, and then how much of that impact it is. I believe that in your notes, it states that there is supposed to be a regulation that ballast water it's supposed to be, or, or vessels are supposed to clean uh, the, uh, the ballast water out of the three nautical mile of the territory water, is that correct? That is correct. Um, I think that I think the issue that we were having with the one of the issues that we having with the the ballast water was we we have been introduced to invasive species being added into our waters, which have caused a lot of issues from the the lionfish to the invasive seagrass. And now the I don't know if it's me, Julian. I can hardly hear you. Is it me or is it you? Can anyone hear yes. Julian? Uh, Lance Mount, for the record, no, he seems to uh, be breaking up. Only coral disease. So uh, that's that's a big problem. And, can you guys hear? Yeah, Can you hear me? Uh, Nicole, Hello. Greer, Nicole Greer here. Julian, we lost your last two sentences. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. So I don't know what happened. If you can uh, repeat what, what you said. Yes, I'm going to repeat what I said. I says the issue that we had with the the ballast water was these are some of the issues. And anyone, please join in or the introduction of invasive species such as the lionfish, the invasive seagrass, and also um, now the stony coral disease. And that, that seems to be a big problem. What's happening in our fisheries if the um, ballast water is not released in the right location, which is outside of the three mile um, nautical mile zone, which I still have an issue with, but um, we're, we're, we're seeing that, we're seeing the increase from um, those species due to the fact of the ballast water. So please, anyone join in? So from what you're saying, I understand that it's a negative impact on essential fish habitat. Well, I don't know if, if, if yeah, it's a negative impact, yes. You have an issue with the uh, with the uh, a distance from shore that this is being done. So you think that that ballast water can it 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 provides a very high uh, impact on on by bringing in a invasive species and impacting corals by providing the pathogens you know for the coral diseases. So would that be a high, medium, or low? How much of an impact would that have? I say it's high. I, I think it's a it's a major problem. Okay, so Julian, we would like to do this by consensus. So if if I think that the best way would be if no one has no one opposes what you just said and what we've written on the screen. I believe you can see the Excel file, correct? Yes. Yes. So if you can see the Excel file, we'll be doing uh, the same thing for all of them. And if no one opposes uh, what you say, then by consensus, the total number of participants, which I think today we have eight, uh, would determine you know, that, 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 that establishes the consensus of the group, correct? Does, does anyone have a, a something they would like to add to what I said or have an issue with what I said so we can move forward? I agree, Julian. Well, I believe it's high as well. 
Yes, Lance Monum for the record. Uh, yes, I believe it's high as well. I think that's problem ballast water around the world with them transferring all kinds of uh, 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 species to uh, different parts of the world. So, uh, yeah, I believe it's high here as well. Colin Butler for the record. I, I agree as well. Okay. So by consensus, that's going to be your score, and that's what we're going to include in the ECM. So the next few are directly related to the driving component of closed areas. So these you have divided into inshore reefs, lagoons in Benner Bay, offshore reefs, seagrass beds, seasonal closures, and managed species. We think that probably putting a, and, and this is a question for the group, something like a closed areas and essential fish habitat or or habitats in terms of the inshore reef lagoons offshore reefs and seagrasses <clears throat> would probably collapse or if you have very specific no very specific notion of how a closed area impacts the inshore reefs and the closed areas the, the uh, Benner bay and the offshore reefs then we can leave them separate so you let us know what you're uh, thinking about this is. You can leave them separate and tell me what effect the closed area has on these areas. Would these be positive impacts that the closed areas have because they will protect uh, the habitats and the fish species within those areas? Or is it negative because being closed, you cannot fish and therefore there is no uh, fishing going on what in which direction are you thinking this is going well i would think it, it would be a this is Joy mcgrath for the record i would think that it's it's a positive impact but um the, you know one of the problems with us you know um having all of these different closures is not doing any assessment so how you know what are we going off of is what we think it's supposed to be doing so, but I, I do think the area closures are doing well. The issue with that, another issue with that is what are the invasive species doing in those areas? And what are we doing to remove the invasive species? Um, example, of lionfish from those areas. So, um, but I think overall area closures are a positive um, impact. That's my comment. I'll let the rest of the team join in. Maybe hey, the other thing, Julian, what we can do is that if, if everyone agrees with you, you know, silence will be consensus. If anyone needs to add anything else, then, you know, please do chime in. Uh, but if everyone agrees, then we leave it up as positive. And then would it be low, medium, high having you having your statement that there is no evaluation of these closed areas, but that you all think that it's positive? It might not be a high impact because of all the invasive species. So, you know, this can be a medium or a low, given that we don't have information to to give back to you in terms of the of the impact of those closed areas. All right, I'll leave someone else comment if what you guys think, high, medium, low. Well, uh, Lance Mon, for the record, it seems there's a, a, a big difference between, say, uh, you know, each of these. I don't know if you could categorize them all as the same. The offshore reefs are totally different from the inside lagoons. Um, inside lagoons, due to just various different runoffs of the island, uh, uh, you know, are uh, much more highly polluted and have a lot, lot more problems than the offshore reefs, which are getting, of course, fresh water, uh, no, you know, cleaner water running across them. But um, so I would just say, uh, you know, that they are a little bit different. Put a, categorize, categorizing them all exactly the same, uh, I don't know if that would be correct. There are, some of these areas are quite different. Okay, so we are leaving them separate as inshore, the lagoons, the offshore reefs and seagrass beds, but the closed areas still have a positive impact of them. We we're taking notes of the regulatory issues with the inshore and, the, and the, specifically the lagoons with the regulatory issues that there should be 
you know, some way of stopping the runoff and, and pollution that comes out of that. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, I agree. So I would say, you know, I, you know, please join in everyone. Um, I would say the inshore reefs would be medium. The um, Lagoon Bena Bay is low because of the because of the chemical problem that they have in there right now. The offshore reefs, I would say, is high. And the sea graph, I would put as medium because of the anchoring and um, not enough moorings to accommodate to accommodate the, the yachts. So I'll let everyone else chime in. If they agree, they don't agree, or it should go either or other way. Yeah, I have no problem with what you've got listed there, uh, Julian. Uh, Lance, on for the record. Okay. All right. I mean, hearing nothing else. So by consensus, these are the scores that we put to this. We still have two other closed areas and the impact on seasonal closures and on managed species. Uh, and Julian, we are taking note of all the regulatory issues because you know the the St. Thomas St. John DAP had uh, specifically looked at that problem of regulatory uh, regulatory enforcement throughout other agencies. So we're keeping track of that also. Okay. All right. So let's see. We're missing closed areas to seasonal closure and closed areas to manage species. And Leah, hi, if we have any notes on these, and remember that, yes, you know, things had been discussed. We just don't want to miss anything. So if you think that these do not apply anymore, we can uh, take them out of the list. Uh, if I may speak, I have on my notes here from what I gather from previous notes on from July 30. 2019 uh, closure evaluations in parentheses referring to both spatial and temporal concepts. Uh, that's what I got here. Um, I don't know if there was any other um, specific comment related to those two components, affected components. Thank you. Should we uh, leave them here or take them out? These are part also of your fisheries uh, model. Well, I, th I think they need to stay the both of them are positive. Okay. Yes, I would agree. Perfect. And now the score. As far as, as, far as the scores, I'm open for suggestions. Uh, this is Nicole Grio and Julia, you can help me out with this too. For the seasonal closures, um, I'm feeling that that should be medium simply because as we were discussing in previous meetings, we haven't had any um, proof or there hasn't been any new scientific studies um, disclosed on that. Uh, do you agree? Yes, I do agree. Yes, I would agree. And I, and I would say the managed species will be medium also. Due to the fact we've been protecting these large groupers and we don't know what they're actually doing to the ref, rest of the, the fish in that area because of their large consumption of food that they eat. So, you know, that's something that I mentioned recently that um, we protecting all of these big groupers and uh, they're multiplying. So with them multiplying, their demand for food also increases. So what are they actually doing to the rest of the, the stock that's, um, that's within the area? Because when we have a closed season, and let's use the MCD as a perfect example, the Red Hind M MCD, it, it, it was, it's there to protect the hind, but we're not only protecting the hind, we're protecting every species inside of that area. So um, 
with the Heinz getting to large sizes and the, the, the NASA groupers and the yellowfin groupers and all the other group of species moving into those areas, what are they actually doing to the rest of the smaller species that are inside that area? So that's what I would put it as a medium for. Okay, perfect. So hearing no other comments by consensus. All right. So coastal development to shoreline erosion. That would be a negative. This is Gilbert Levan. Hi. Okay. We all agree, right? I think that that's yeah, we, we are crossing putting all the dots over the I's and crossing all the T's. So bear with us, okay? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, no, I Okay, so hearing nothing else, communication to compliance and communication to council authority. Leah, hi, do we have any notes on on this communication? Yes. This was actually uh, discussed on the first meeting on May 26, 2019. What I retrieved from the notes are that communication how do we get them involved identify who we want involved get them to participate that's <laughs> that's all i got regarding communication component and that's the only thing they talk about it there's no other side notes on on it so from what i've heard from that comment that would be that <clears throat> in order to increase compliance uh, you need to increase communication so right now there shouldn't be i mean there is a problem with communication so is therefore this one a uh, how do you want to see it a positive or a negative the council has the outreach and education there is the liaison uh, people from for the virgin islands now Something that need, needs to be brought up to the uh, to the council level again. Well, I think communication is always. Sorry, I was just going to say that yes, communication has always been an issue and a problem. Nicole Grio, um, I was going to say the the same thing as far as communication goes. Um, in regards to compliance, that definitely has been an issue. And I feel like this should be brought up for discussion with all of the factors for both of these things. Okay, so in this case, communication has impacted negatively the uh, rate of compliance. Lack of communications has impacted negatively the rate of compliance. Would that be a correct statement? Yes. Needs to be improved. And that would have been a... Aye. Okay. Consensus? Silence? Yes, I agree. Oh, great, thank you. And the same thing for a communication to council authority, as I heard Nicole say before. And on the council side with communication with us, that would be um, medium. Okay. From, from where I'm standing, from my point. And just for the record, I am the fisheries liaison for St. Thomas, St. John. If everyone else in the DAP feels the same. Yes, I agree. Lance Mom for the record. Okay. Hearing nothing else. Done. Okay, so coral reef to essential fish habitat. This is Leah speaking. Um, 
notes from March 26, 2019. Uh, we've got coral reefs and juvenile habitat are not doing great. And you see skittles from Florida and took off in Florida after dredging in our harbor and now St. Thomas. And that's all I got there. That's all we got in the in the notes. So yeah, so so this is reviewing all of the notes, all of the notes from everyone, all the video that we've had from the uh, or the recordings that we've had from the DAP meetings. Uh, what do you want to do with corals to essential fish habitat? Well, I think it's supposed to be positive. But I, okay, so. If I'm wrong, are you, come on team, I need to hear from you guys. All right, this is Nicole Grio. Um, so with the essential fish habitats, this is sort of a double issue with us because right now studies that have been going on with both NOAA and with different um, coral organizations and the University of the Virgin Islands, we are losing a lot of the health of our essential fish habitats around the islands of both St. Thomas and St. John. So it is a positive thing, but however, as far as the, um, the health of it goes, that's, that's not good. So I don't know if we have any other scientists that are on right now. Um, Madeline, I believe is St. Croix um, fishery for the East End Park. I'm not really sure, but maybe she can help with this. Yeah, so this is a little bit outside of what I would be able to speak to scientifically. I'm in the Mars Hill office here on St. Croix for policy issues. Okay, but, but the so, thing is that, so that yeah, I guess go ahead. That, here's a question. This is Gilbert now. Is the question as it relates to essential fish habitats, are they being affected positively or negatively? Is that what you're asking us to, or the condition of them right now? And if that is the question, I'd say essential fish habitats in the in the St. Thomas, St. John district are being affected ne negatively right now. But just any clarification on what exactly the, the question is, right? Okay, so coral reefs, you know, from what we heard Julian state that with the diseases that are uh, invading the, the coral itself, then that's a negative impact on essential fish habitat in general. In the case of the research that it's being done, uh, there is a lot of research going on in terms of the coral reefs, uh, but, uh, and you are losing a lot of uh, essential fish habitat in the, uh, in the St. Thomas, St. John area. So in this case, I mean, that all points to uh, if everything was well, then it would be a positive impact because things are not going well, then this might be a negative impact. And the rate at which coral reefs are being uh, uh, losing are losing their health and it's impacting uh, its function as essential fish habitat, then that would be a low, medium, or high impact as you see it from your perspective. Okay, so if everything was fine, it would be positive. But everything that I've heard is that there are problems with the coral reefs in St. Thomas, St. John. Yes, yeah, I think that needs to be changed to a negative. Okay. When it's not for the record. Thank you. And then in that case, I mean, is it spreading the disease at a rate that it's alarming, that you consider that it's uh, definitely having a very high impact on uh, EFH as a whole, or is it a very low spread? Uh... So that's the issue right there. The essential fish habitats are not directly affecting any of the um, stony coral tissue disease that's going on for the coral reefs. However, it is the amount of pollution um, and the increase in temperatures and things like that that are affecting the essential fish habitats. Now, they, they're not as healthy as they should be, but they are starting to show struggling in the count of um, new hatchings that are taking place in the amount of the number of 
uh, species that we normally see in these estuaries, that's all that's going on there. So I'm, we can do negative and we can put high, but I'm not sure what that's going to do afterwards. And this is. So you, we'll make sure that the other connection that you've mentioned, I think it's already made from pollution to either coral reefs or to essential fish habitat. And that's how this gets connected from coral reefs and the spread of disease, et cetera, to a impacting essential fish habitat in general. Did I hear you correctly? Correct. Okay. I would say, I would say, Julia McGrath for the record, I would say negative and medium. So, okay. you know, I need to hear, I need to hear from everyone else. Is it high or is it medium? It's medium. We... That's correct, Julian. Yes, I would agree, Lance Mom, for the record. Ruth Gomez, for the record, medium. Gilbert, for the record, medium. Okay, so by consensus, the group agrees that it's a medium impact. Okay, let me just... Okay, just saving it so that it doesn't go away. So the next one, fisheries management to invasive species. So this is one of those, uh, I don't think we have a, do we have any comments on this, Leah? Hi. I was reading on the notes. Um, okay. Uh, from fisheries management to invasive species, uh, there are there is a note about it. Inva it says invasive species and ballast water should take a step farther. The grandfather system for older ships needs to be addressed by USCG. Any kind of funding assistance from the powers that be. Um, that's all regarding or almost related to to invasive species and fisheries management. There's no other info of notes on it. Okay, so is fisheries management having a, a positive or a negative impact on these inv invasive species? Are there any regulations, anything that, uh, that deals with uh, uh, affecting these invasive species? And you mentioned already the lionfish, the uh, seagrass, the uh, spread of coral disease. Uh, Well, Lance, Mom, for the record, um, it seems to me that fisheries management can only be, you know, uh, a positive Im impact on it. But, you know, to the degree that it's positive, because uh, sort of a losing battle with uh, there's so many invasive species, you know, you can only do so much. But it's not as if, you know, we do need the fisheries management to do what they can. But it goes back to one of your key items might be the lack of enforcement. So if there is lack of enforcement in terms of uh, uh, taking care of, would that be the, the connection that you want to make? So it should be positive, but right now it might be low because there is no enforcement. Uh, well, I, I think all of the, 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 the next, all of the rest of this this line here would, would go to lack of enforcement. The next 10 items from looking at it would go to the lack of enforcement. Okay, so that would impact your your high, medium, low score here. So in this case, that this would all be a low positive because there is lack of enforcement. That sounds yes, correct. I, I I would say yes. Nicole Greer, I agree. Okay. And would you agree based on what you just said? So it's nothing, nothing else to discuss in terms of fisheries management by consensus, we all agree. Plants mom for the record, yes, I agree. Okay. So let's go to lack of pump out stations to sewage outfalls. There is a note about it. Um, runoff, of, runoff of primarily sewage a treatment plant with pipe going out into the ocean, pump right into the harbor, pipes going out deep, 
sewage outfalls of primary treated waste, houses all bump into waterway. Yes, I think this is a very, very, one of the largest problems, I believe, Lance Mount for the record. I agree, it's a negative. Okay. And it's high, Nicole. Yes. Yeah. High as well. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, lack of recycling and coastal runoff. Negative. And high. And high. Okay. By consent. So, I'm going to wait for someone to oppose it. If I don't hear anyone saying that's not true, yeah. I'll continue. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sounds great. So land-based sources of pollution to marine debris. Negative. Aye. Okay, so now you have five or six lithium ion batteries. This was so specifically mentioned that uh, uh, we kept everything separate. So tell us what you think, what you, know of lithium ion batteries and endangered species. I'm just going to go across the board, guys, and say this should be negative for all of these. And the main reason I'm saying this is um, we really have no way in the Virgin Islands as a whole of managing these batteries. Um, and you know the condition of our dumps. So um, at some point, it is going to be an issue. So it just says high across the board. Okay. I totally agree. Yeah, Lance, I'm for the record, I agree. Great, thank you very much. And and the other thing that I want to mention is that remember that all these items that are here, eh, either they, they'll be part of the documents that will be prepared for the fishery ecosystem plan, okay? So eh, even if the score doesn't get too high, gets them too high, they will be part of the uh, documentation. Mm -hmm. So live aboard, houseboats, private vessels, and compliance. This is an issue that it's increasing in the Virgin Islands. Is it? Yes, Not in definitely... here. Okay. Well, um, Lance, mom, for the record, um, the live board and houseboats and private vessels, um, I got here in 87 on a small sailboat and lived on it for three years. And, uh, you know, well, it, you could have one argument that says, okay, well, yeah, there is a little bit of pollution. It's the uh, sewage is pumped straight into the water, uh, you know, and that they could be contributing. But it's my opinion that uh, the, you know, uh, if you, what is there, 150,000 people on St. Thomas, 100,000 people on St. Thomas, most of that. Uh, sewage getting pumped straight out and I uh, you know in comparison I think it's relatively low the amount of pollution that they create in comparison with say pump out stations and stuff like that but I mean you know if the question is is they uh, you know if you told them all of a sudden you told them all to leave would it be less pollution well probably yeah a little bit but then you know I mean where do the boats go or you know I mean uh, it's always been something here in St. Thomas people live on boats you know the people that uh, uh, you know drive boats for a living they're not living on it but then they're uh, you know they go out and they take people out boating for fun and that's their livelihood and so there's always gonna be boats but uh, anyway bottom line is I'm saying do they pollute yeah a little bit but I think in relation to a lot of other things that not near as a size of pollution and, and do you think that these vessels uh, do impact compliance? I mean, are they complying with the regulations or is that the actual problem that there is? So that I think, lack I, I, this is Gilbert here. I think to Lance's point is this, I think we want people to come and enjoy the Virgin Islands. And, you know, we look at it from a fishery standpoint, but the resource is here for everybody. And I think um, the issue at hand is, is the compliance, is that there are rules on the books, but it's not being enforced. And I think there's room for um, private vessels and all of that, just like us as a fisherman. But again, it's an enforcement and a compliance issue. So when you look at it from that point, and especially with COVID, the amount of traffic we have, 
it is a negative, um, but I put it as moderate because I don't want to chase those people away at the same time, you know? So that's, that's my- Or, or perhaps even low, I would say. This, um, is, this is for the record. Um, so one of the things that I have noticed, I grew up in a cove area and the amount of <clears throat> over the last 10 years have dramatically increased. And like Mr. Levon was saying, compliance for rules and regulations are not being followed. They're not be being enforced. Yes, it is a negative effect. And as far as the level of it, I would say that it would be medium, not low, simply because of the amount of liveaboards and private vessels that we have that are now in our lagoons and in our mooring areas. But then that's just my personal opinion from observation. So Ruth Gomez, for the record, um, I believe it's high. The amount of liveaboards, um, even pre-COVID, there is no pump out station. There is no pump out vessel. There is absolutely nothing that the local government has done for years that facilitates any way that the liveaboards can pump their their um, uh, their tanks out. There's sewer tanks out or whatever the proper navigational terminology is. And now with COVID, you know, I live up in so. I live up where I can see the entire Charlotte Amalie Harbor and the amount of boats that are here, state that are here all the time and come and go has severely increased. I mean, if you take a look at Megan's Bay, if you take a look at any of those other beaches, I mean, literally you hear people complain about how these vessels are rafted together and they're here for, for weeks at a time. So I don't believe it's low under normal circumstances pre-COVID just because there is no facility for them to pump it out. Um, and how if I live aboard my vessel, how much times am I going to take up anchor and go out to pump out my, my tanks? I don't think so. People constantly complain about the stench of, of uh, or the people that pump out their vessels in, in John Brewer's Beach. Um, so no, I don't believe low should even be there. Um, it should be at least medium to high. Um, and just because of the number and there is no compliance. Yeah, Colin Butler for the record. I agree more so with Ruth as well. Um, I mean, live aboard houseboats, um, in this particular private vessels alone, just staying in, um, at the docks in the marinas, um, I know a lot of these marinas actually allow liveaboards um, in the marina and the fact that these marinas don't actually provide pump out services at the marina, that should say enough right there. Um, I leave the marina a lot early in the morning and I could tell you what I smell when I leave in the morning and it's not pretty. We all know what everybody does early in the morning. Well, Lance, mom, for the record, um, you know, this, this involves, uh, uh, a compliance as well. Uh, it's my understanding uh, back in the day there was more areas. Basically, people were, um, they had a place to, a company was coming to the boats and taking their sewage and bringing it to a pump out station that then basically just pumped it into the bay, which is not piped, piped out any further. So basically, liveaboard boaters who were complying were basically paying a fee to a company that is taking the sewage to a pump up station that does not treat it at all and then pumping it into the bay. So then, uh, you know, I mean, what is the point of complying when that is, you know, it's just getting pumped right into the bay anyway. I mean, that goes right back to the pump up stations and treatment of sewage, or if you're just kind of cycle, that's just not changing anything. Okay, we're gonna be compliant. Okay, we bring the sewage to the plant. They just pump it right back into the water. So to that point, then I, it is high um, because like all the other issues before, this is like a kind of a St. Thomas, St. John, Virgin Islands, Caribbean issue, where as these little islands, all of our waste, we need to treat and start thinking about differently. Um, and it, it's not something that we're going to solve here today, but um, it's high. You know, how we manage waste as a whole, it, um, whether it be solid, you know, sanitary, 
all of these things are totally connected. So it's got to be high, guys. It, I, Ruth Gomez, it has to be high. It goes back to my point, you know, and it's exactly what Colin and um, Gilbert said. There is no way. Um, there is no facility. There is nothing to facilitate the pumping of these tanks aboard these liveaboards, um, liveaboard boats. And like I said, you know, pre-COVID, there was more than enough. And now with COVID, it has even multiplied. So definitely it needs to be high, just as well as the government needs to recognize that they need to do something um, in order to facilitate the pumping of these tanks. You can't just keep, you know, pouring it into the environment. So I Lance totally Mom, for the record agree. again. Sorry, What's, Lance Mom, for the record again. It's just my concern. Yeah, it's just my concern that uh, pretty much since I got here in '87, uh, you know, basically many people have complained about the sewage of uh, of the boaters. And uh, again, uh, like I say, is if there was proper waste, uh, you know, and then it was treated properly before it was dumped back in goes right back to the pump stations, but it's just my concern that the, the people are living on boats have pretty much always been uh, um, uh, not liked, basically, by the people of Virgin Islands who are flushing their toilets. Some people have septic systems. Others go into closer to town or to... Lance, uh, Lance, know. Lance, uh, Lance, this is Ruth. Please, yes, please I'm don't Ruth. make those kinds of statements like the people of the Virgin Islands have never liked live aboard. I take offense to that as a born and raised Virgin Islander. We're not even gonna go there. I think we're done with this subject and we need to move on because um, we're going down a hole that we don't need to go down. Yes. Okay, uh, okay. So I understand your opinion, Ruth. I am just expressing my opinion. And so, I'm not, I'm not, right. not trying hello. to be- any Hello, hello. I'm the people yes, of the Virgin hello, Island. I'm saying hello. Hello, hello, let's move on. We got okay. their points across. We don't need to make this personal. So, so we're do gonna, I have we're consensus gonna... for this or do I go with? Yes, it's agreed. Negative and high. Negative and high. Okay. Lance, I mean, hearing one opposition, uh, I can do seven and that would be fine. Uh, so tell me what you want yeah, me to yeah. do. Yeah, I would say do seven. Yes, please. Seven, okay. one. Okay, and we've taken notes of, uh, of the discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, restoration to coastal runoff. It's a negative and high. The reason I say negative that and is, high. Is, yeah, if nobody- yeah, Negative I mean, and high, definitely. <clears throat> Agreed. Can I, can I hear what you had to say, please? Who, who was speaking? The reason Gilbert. why I say this, this is, is Gilbert. I, I say that because okay. um, when it comes to coastal runoff, we always think of definitely the mangroves first. And yeah, we know the condition of them. But as you know, we had the storms that have gone through 2017 and, you know, it's dry season. When you look out on these hillsides, there are no large trees. That's another part of this, this whole thing that we need to start planting large trees inland to help with all of that. So um, that's why I put that as negative and high. Thank you. Okay, so everyone agrees? Yes. Okay, so Roundup slash pesticides to uh, fisheries. I would say it's clearly a negative, but I just don't know how much pesticides or what the farming is like in the Virgin Islands. Um, so I don't know if there's anybody else here. I know Mr. Lede, you do some farming. Um, I don't know if you could interject at all. Uh, uh, Winston Lede, well, I think they, they passed a law to prevent uh, sun sunblock from people using sunblock. And also, I don't know, we've been having no rain, so we've been having much runoff lately. So I don't know what the effect of that is. I think it, it's more, of the, the dumps of the stuff that we carry to the dumps that's seeping into our water and causing that, you know, pesticides. Well, to get Lance, Lance Monum for the record, um, 
if we're speaking just of pesticides for agriculture, um, I don't think, for example, I have a, a, a house and my girlfriend of just the last two years has decided to become uh, growing all kinds of different vegetables and everything like that. And I can't tell you how many water trucks I've had to buy for her garden. So when she brings up a tomato, I'm like, oh, this $200 tomato, that's great. You know, anyway, so I'm just saying, I don't know how many people actually farm here because water is, is, uh, is a, you know, a, a scarce sometimes and it's hard and you end up having to pay a lot of money to get your vegetables. But that's uh, just, I don't know other parts of the island, if there are some, uh, you do have people maybe. And if you're talking about, you're adding in sunscreen to the pesticides, then, that, then it's definitely high because that's a big part of it is the sunscreen. Is that correct? Is this part of a, the, the sunscreen is part of this column? Sunscreen is on the bottom of the list. Yep. Um, Colin uh, Butler, for the record, um, with Roundup and pesticides, I think just general chemical disposal of just like general household chemicals, for example, should be included on there because, uh, you know, just landscaping companies that spray Roundup and do whatever, um, just the basic, basic household disposal of, of cleaning chemicals. Um, even in the marine industry, people are cleaning down their boats with all kinds of uh, random um, varieties of uh, supplies that uh, clean their boats. And um, I think all that adds. And so I think it's very negative. I think it's high because these chemicals are used daily on boats when they're coming in and out, whether it's uh, you know different types of soaps or Clorox or whatever. Um, and with the household chemicals that are being disposed of and just your normal trash go trash going to the to the um, to the dump site and also those you know the dump sites on the sides of the roads so, i mean there's chemicals there and, and oils and all that and just one heavy rain all that's is, is going into our lagoons and our mangrove estuaries so i think it's um it all just stockpiles on top of each other so i think it's negative and i think it's very high and that's colin butler for the record okay so everyone agrees with the scoring? Yes, adding those chemicals. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so we'll we'll keep track of that. Thank you. So you have two for sargassum, sargassum and water quality, and sargassum on market. Negative but low. And the reason this is Nicole Rio. Uh, the reason why I'm saying low for water quality is because this has been going on for decades the water quality however with some studies that have been done at least in the water bay area even with the um, high influx of sargassum that we had a few years ago it does not show a significant negative impact on the juvenile sea life or the other creatures that were in that one particular bay that is already inundated with runoff pollution so just from that one small um, test area. That's why I'm, I personally am going to say that it's low. Ruth Gomez, for the record, um, I want everyone to make sure that um, we don't confuse air quality with water quality when it comes to the sargassum, simply because we know that uh, the horrible odor, odor that it gives off. So let's not confuse above water and below water. When, when we do this, okay? Point Ace. taken, that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, Winston Lede, um, I think for the last three years, we have had a high, a high increase in the sargasm. And I've seen it where the water turns brown while I have my boat and it killed everything when it gets that strong, kills everything. I put lapses in, in a pen and they die overnight. So it does have an effect. I'm not sure if it's, that's what it is that turns the water dark brown. With a, with a, you can't, you know, it, it's not clear at all, but it seems to be happening when the sargasm is real high. Winston, just for a quick science lesson here, this is Nicole. That happens because it does take away a lot of the oxygen that is in the water. Uh, so your lobsters in that case, if you had thrown in maybe an air pump with them, that might have helped them out just a little bit more. But yeah. But what about all the animals that live in the lagoon? 
where I, where my boat's anchored. They can't right, say they die too. They do, and um, that's because of, like I said, what happens when the sargassum is um, breaking down and the chemical change and the oxides that are going on during that decomposition process, but it does correct itself once the sargassum dies off and it also brings other creatures that are able to thrive in that habitat um, to help with the cleanup of it. So it doesn't last forever, which is why I said it was low. Yeah, it does. It does not. It does correct itself. I agree with that. And, and one thing I would like to add to that, you know, it, like Winston is saying it kills everything, but I, I would like to say this. You know, where we have our boats down in Frenchtown, it killed everything, the sea urchins, everything. The, 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 the bottom comes clean, crystal clean. But a week, two weeks after, I don't know what, how it happens, but everything comes back to life. And I don't know, I don't know what causes it, but I have seen it being negative, but I have seen it being positive also because it got rid of all the algae that was there growing. And then all of a sudden you see new corals, you see new urchins, you see a lot of new stuff. So I think it has a negative and a positive impact. So I've seen it both ways. I pay very close attention to it. Okay, so one thing that we can do, I mean, in this case, because uh, there is definitely some uh, research ongoing with the uh, sargassum, and this would point to probably something that needs to be uh, looked at in more detail locally. So you, you can have something like this, uh, and you can have a low medium, or you can just change it to a, a low. Do you want to keep the negative and positive aspects of the impact of sargassum on water quality? Well, I think this is Gilbert here. I think what everybody's pretty much saying is it's the, qual the quantity of it. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's not, we all know sargassum, it's not really affecting the water quality, but when it stacks up in certain bays to Nicole's point, just naturally, it's gonna take the oxygen out. Exactly. But then so you, hear, you hear, you um, hear, uh, Julian say after that, the environment kind of rege regenerates. So it's a new, but you know, it's, it's hard to put it as negative. Like I think negative, positive, like you said, um, the water quality goes down temporarily, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's a total negative. Okay, so you want to go to a low negative. It might be one of these cases that, you know, it would be hard to score, eh, I, and that's okay. Nicole Grio, I think a low negative would be, um, would be the best bet to go on this because even though it does affect the water quality temporarily, like um, Levon said, it's, it's very low. I'm fine with that. Okay, you're in. Nothing else. And moving on, sargassum to market. What you mean by to, to market? So let, let me ask Elia if we have any comments on 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 this one. There is no comment on this one. It was just a connection uh, already established that was pending. And again, I mean, you can dismiss it now if you don't see a connection, if you don't, I mean, believe me, we've, well, Leah, hi more than anyone, <laughs> but Sarah and myself have looked through all of the uh, uh, notes, et cetera, and we just couldn't find anything related to that. I th wasn't um, this is Nicole Grio? Was that not because someone had suggested about the sargassum being utilized for um, either compost or being broken down for some other kind of oils? I believe that was probably why that was put up there. Okay, so in that case, if the market refers to being able to use the sargassum for that, then that would be a positive impact. Correct. Correct, but yes. Leah said yes. that there are no notes. <laughs> so, 
Okay, do you want me to, do you want to keep it or do you want us to delete that line? Julian? Um, I don't know how you guys feel. I, I don't have a problem with deleting it for right now. What's the take on everyone else? I agree. We're not going to shift up and mark it off our side guys in here. Nicole Grew. Ruth Gomez, delete. I agree. My name's Mom for the record. Okay. Okay, so we'll take care of that. And the next one is a sedimentation to land-based sources of pollution. Negative high. Negative high. Negative high. Negative high, Lance. Okay, anyone else? Any, any opposition to that? And the last two, tourism uh, and local, uh, local people to compliance and tourism and local people to sunscreen. I personally think that it's um, it's getting better because of the, the compliance law that was passed. I think that there's still some sunscreen lingering out there that not the compliance one. Um, but I, I, I think the problem with, with this is there's there is more education to the visitors and the locals that is needed because I had some I had some family visiting last week and they they didn't know anything about um, the compliance of, of the new sunscreen so you know they came in with all the the old stuff that they had and I'm, they're telling them well we can use this this is what we got to use so um, I don't know how we would rate it. This but is I know it's definitely, go ahead. Is tourism and local compliance, are we talking about rules and regs? Because sunscreen has its own line. So is that compliance referring to rules and regulations? That's just a question. Yeah, hi, do we have any comments on, on those two topics? From well, Go ahead. Lance Bottom for the record. Um, regarding the sunscreen, yes, yeah, since the uh, Virgin Islands implemented those laws, not allowing those three ingredients. Um, uh, for example, I have a, a business that I sell sunscreen, but um, now I don't sell that much sunscreen anymore. But it's okay, but I sell a lot of rash guards. <laughs> and anyway, Ocean Safari started it, but there are a lot less expensive rash guards today than it was five to seven years ago, and a lot of tourists are wearing rash guards now and not using as much sunscreen, plus with the Virgin Island laws that they passed. So, well, I wouldn't say sunscreen's not a problem. I think it's decreased a lot since the combination of, of the laws of the Virgin Islands, and there's less, less uh, toxic stuff in some of the available sunscreen. Thanks, Lance. Let's go back to Ruth's question to Graciela. From the notes, uh, there is a comment about tourism affecting the compliance, and that was referring to undersized lobsters, as example. That was on the notes. So I think the compliance would be overall compliance of the rules and regs that mm -hmm. are in place for, for the public and for um, the visitors. And yes, there is a problem with that, and we're trying to, to work that out um, with the education and outreach committee of the council. So um, so in this case, it would be still a negative because it has not been completely it eradicated. Be negative, and I would say, I would say negative medium. Negative medium. Ruth. I, I agree. Okay, so hearing no opposition, oops. Eight, eight, okay. And the final one, I mean, you have changed regulations, but I've heard that you still have a problem with sunscreen. So would it be a negative and a low in this case because things are changing? Well, this this is Nicole Griot. 
I do know that a majority of the resorts, as well as the places that are offering ocean um, excursions, they do tell the people that they have to have coral safe sunscreen. And a lot of the places, I don't know about Ocean Safari or any of the other boat charters, but I do know that the ones that I have been on, that they do have um, coral safe sunscreen to offer. So uh, as far as that's concerned, a lot of the visitors that are coming here that I have a chance to get in contact with, they know about safe sunscreen. So for me, this one would be a, a positive, but a low. Okay, would everyone agree with the changes that have taken place? How do you guys feel? <clears throat> well, Lance, on for the record, yeah, well, I would say, yeah, it's turned around quite a bit since uh, the laws have been implemented. A lot of people are cooperating. Um, you know, I mean, um, if you're asking about if that issue is turning around and uh, getting much better, and that's why you're putting it as a positive, then I would agree. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, any of those oils at all going in there is going to be a negative, but it has turned around quite a bit. So if that's the reason for the positive, then, yeah, I would agree. I agree. I agree. A positive low. I agree. Positive low. Sorry, I was in mute. So thank you very much. We finished with the main uh, issues that we had. Now I'm going to very quickly go over to the uh, to the uh, boxes that we had left over from the previous mental modeler. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, strong winds, ground swells, and heavy rains being the driving component. Do you want to keep them as such? And what do you see is the affected component in this case? Uh, you do have a uh, other weather uh, things in your in your uh, model, but these were mentioned specifically as such, but there was no connection and nothing to tie them to. So is there any speci anything specific that strong winds affect? Like for example, it it affects a it might affect positively the fisheries for lobster, but it might affect negatively other fisheries. So in the end, it's a, you know, a, it might be a negative impact on fisheries. Anything specific that you... Uh, strong winds, strong winds, you can't go fishing. I don't know. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, I mean, you can drop them all or you can just make a statement like such, you know, and, uh, and, and tell me what, you know, effect it has. So in this case, it would be negative, right? Yes. And strong winds would definitely be, you know, a, a local seasonal uh, high impact. Is that correct? I would say medium. Anyone else? Okay, ground swells. Wouldn't, this is Ruth, wouldn't strong winds, ground swells, and heavy rain pretty much have the same effect across? They would affect the fisheries, it would have a negative impact, right? Uh, well, except for your lobster with the ground swells. Um, and it would be medium because it's all seasonal. It's not consistent all year round. So the well, only thing that would be different really would be the ground swells and Julian and Winston and Colin, Matthew, um, your lobsters run better after a ground swell provided you could find your traps, correct? When still a day, yes, but I, I have to say the ground swell, swells cleans the beaches and the areas that are, are you know have a lot of current. It 
But Let's, I I was I was also gonna jump in. I think the ground yeah. swells and heavy rains they'll have at, at least with ground swells you have coastal erosion issues, especially after the storms and the fact that we don't have the mangroves. Um, I I mean if you run up the narrows up St. John, where you've seen those big swells that came through the storms, um, you have a lot of erosion still going on when you get a ground swell. Um, heavy rain, you, um, because again, the trees, um, all of that, that does affect um, the water. So um, I guess it, it's fisheries, but I think you, you have to add a, a land-based water quality um, component to both ground swells and heavy rain. I, I look at ground, so I look at ground. Go ahead, Winston, then I'll make a yeah, comment. I, I, was say, I, I was saying that ground swells have a positive impact also. They clean the beaches, they lift up the mud and carry it out. When the, after the rains fall and you got mud settling anywhere, it cleans because it, 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 the current, it stores it up and the current takes it back out. So it does have a positive effect. The ground swells, you know, to a degree. Now, if they get way too big, they have a negative effect because they'll roll your traps up, bury them in gravel and, and that type of stuff. And, uh, uh, but that's rarely that you have that, uh, that huge swell. You have it once every five years or so. And, and I agree with Winston as well as beach cleaning too. So um, it, it's, it goes both ways, you know? The, the ground swell is positive also, especially in the north of the island. And that's why we don't see secretary cases on the north of the island because the bottom and that side of the island, it's always cleaning itself with the ground swells. And that's a very, very important um, component to this here. And that's why you say ground swell has a lot of positives to it. Compared to the south where we have issues with Sigaterra and the north, we don't have those issues. And I strongly believe, I'm not a scientist with a degree, but I'm a scientist hands-on, that that's, that's due to the fact of the ground swells always cleaning the bottoms. So the way that I've set it up, that we've set it up here, ground swells to fisheries is positive in its majority. Would that be a, a medium also or? Yes, I would say medium. And then I've we've added ground swells to lobster specifically as a positive and to water quality, ground swells and heavy rain also as positive. Uh, Lance Mon, well, for the record, uh, heavy rain, it seems to me, I could be wrong it. on this. It's just, just my opinion is that it's, uh, well, it may clean St. Thomas. It's bringing a lot of pollution into the water. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I I agree. I wouldn't say heavy rain is. A, a yeah, positive. I would move. I would remove number ten. I I agree. And leave it up above where number four is. Um, negative. Medium. Okay, and for the lobster positive, that's also a medium or. Or is yes. that always the case? Medium, okay. And wait, 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 wait. For the ground swells for the lobster, you specifically added a line for the lobster, right? And the ground swells, so that should be high. Okay. Okay, it could be, yeah. Okay, and we also have ground swells to water quality as a positive in terms of all the, uh, we've heard of the cleaning, et cetera. I will put high. Okay. Then we also had the state government DPNR, but I think that that really belongs in your fisheries model with all the regulatory issues. Correct? Yes, we can remove that. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. And then we also had beaches and natural filters. Uh, and I don't know if Lehigh has any comments specifically for those. Hold on. But we're, you know, we went through everything. <laughs> I just want to make sure that nothing's missing from what you. Okay. It says from the notes, uh, when the beaches are not safe, uh, 
they send out adversaries, adversaries affect tourism. Adversaries not sent to tourism office, so tourists don't know, only goes to radio stations. Oh, uh, they're talking about the beach advisory. Um, Water quality. Yeah, DPNR, um, they have environmental pr protection. They do a uh, weekly beach sampling, I believe. Yeah, weekly. Um, and uh, they send out an advisory to the public telling them which be beaches are safe to swim. So in this case, it would be the actual DPNR advisory for the Correct. beaches that right. impacts tourism. I don't know if it impacts tourism because they don't really, they don't really nope. get the beach advisory, you know? It's more the, the local people um, that really pay attention to the beach advisory. Okay, and that has a positive impact, correct? Correct. Yes. And it's highly used, moderately yes, used? It's highly used, especially after a heavy rain or during the hurricane season. They look for that beach advisory to see which beaches are safe. Perfect. Okay. And one final thing, natural filters. There are no notes on that one. We don't want to leave any, any uh, rock unturned. So if anyone knows what natural filters are, please tell us or we can, you know, delete it. Natural I filters, the only thing I could think about is the mangrove lagoon. So you have mangrove lagoons already in your in your uh, conceptual model. Do you want me to specifically state natural filter slash mangrove lagoons? Um, if it's already in the model, no, you don't have to. Um, unless somebody else can think of something else that we may have referred to as a natural filter. <laughs> Okay, so what's the pleasure of the committee? I would say remove it. Remove. Any objections? No. No objections. Okay, great. So one last thing. And this is the part that deals specifically with your fisheries A model. And I think we, we, we have half an hour left. So one of the things that you wanted to do very much was to actually have all the players at the table, but that hasn't happened yet. So if we want to go very quickly through, I mean, most of it has to do with very specific things like lobster to commercial fishers, lobsters to recreational fisheries. So, what do you want to do with your uh, fisheries model? Do you want to address it at this time with the same scoring that you've used thus far? And as you can see in the image, I mean, there are a number of things that you've already uh, scored from your general model. And then we would need to see what these specifics are. So to give you an example, the driving component would be the data collection to fisheries management. This is something that it's really needed uh, to, to have change, to evaluate the fisheries, et cetera. Does your data collection have a positive impact on fisheries management? Are we gonna do this, everyone? We're gonna get this done. We sure as heck gonna try, Julian. Nicole Grio here. Okay, so it's gotta be a positive effect. One at a time. Ruth, go ahead first. I think it has a positive and a negative effect. It all de depends on what your data tells you. Um, it, it 
to me, it doesn't, it, it can go either way. It could be either positive or negative. Correct. I agree with Ruth, but I guess the, the overall issue is just the, the collection of data itself, right? That right. we don't have, we don't have the data at hand to really um, make the proper decisions. Exactly. So then that would be three, four, five, and six, right? Because those so, are DFW. But tell me you want positive, negative, or just positive, or what do you want me to, so that I can just copy it down? <laughs> <laughs> no, for the fisheries management, right? The data collection and the management that comes from that data collection, it could be positive or negative because not all the data collected, well, well let me rephrase that. Not, not all the data collected is, or all the issues are data deficient. There are some issues, there are some things that they collect data on that they're very good at, and there are some that is just lacking. So you can't just, for me, you can't just go either positive or negative. Um, it's not just like a one shot thing. So, you know, yeah, they need more biostatistical sampling um, for the commercial. You're missing the recreational data, you know? So it's, to me, it's specific on the effort that has been placed on data collection historically. And some has been good and some has been really absent. This is Nicole Grio uh, for the data collection and fishery management. Data collection in a whole in itself is a positive thing. For fishery management, it's positive. However, for the fisheries themselves, as far as commercial fishers go, it could potentially be negative, but the data collection and its whole for fishery management is positive. The effect on that data um, can be a negative effect as far as the fisheries for commercial goes could be negative, but the data collection across the board, I feel is positive as far as management is concerned. So, so you have in four and five, fisheries dependent and independent sampling to data collection. That would be so, positive, especially independent sampling. So that would be a what? A positive. Correct, as far as I'm concerned. Anyone else? So your fisheries independent sampling, the only program I know that is fisheries independent is CMAP. Am I mistaken? No, but, but again, I mean, remember that the things, this is what you know and what you see, but would you, see would you want to see more fishery independent data collection yes would you like that to come from the dpnr from the university of the virgin islands etc so these you know you can conceive these as positive right because yes. they would all be collecting uh, information yeah and would you and also that that collection to the DFW. And now how do you foresee uh, this data collection really merging or really happening? I mean, do, would they need to be done urgently and well, or, you know, it can take many years from now. You've been talking about all the evaluations that need to be done in the previous uh, it's Bears, high. so it's high. It's high. Yep. It's high. Nicole Grio, definitely high. Especially okay. when it comes to the University of the Virgin Islands um, independent sampling. And the reason why I'm saying that is because hundreds of students, uh, three of them that I personally know and helped with their thesis that go out and do these studies for their thesis work, especially for their master classes, and their work doesn't get published or doesn't get shared by the uh, um, division. So that's something that's concerning to me as well. Okay, so that's a good good example. Okay, so that's regarding data collection. Now we move on to compliance and fisheries. 
from statements to the council, for example, there is testimony that commercial landings data, it's 100% uh, and there is no need for, for uh, correction factors. So compliance is a positive impact on fisheries. Yes. Uh, yes, I know. Yes, yes. Correct, yes. Okay, and the magnitude? Hi. Okay, and then I'll Hi, find definitely. the eights later. So habitat to fisheries. So how are the habitats in St. Thomas, St. John? Eh? This, is, this is Nicole Brio. That goes back to what we were talking about um, at the beginning for the list. It's positive, but just barely hanging on. So that would be positive. And uh, you say that it's barely hanging on, meaning that it's to, uh, its, to its positive um, status. So I would say positive medium, if anyone else can go through that. And it's just the studies that we've been doing. So again, you, you are making a general statement regarding habitats, and you already had a discussion on the inshore versus the offshore, et cetera. So that's all being taken into consideration. In this case, it has to do with the regulatory agencies with your, or at least what you had in mind at the time of, you know, who are the people that deal with the habitat issues and are they doing what they're supposed to be doing, et cetera. So if habitat is a driving component and it's affecting your fisheries, it's affecting them if they're healthy in a positive manner. And it's then the rating is correct, positive medium. Okay. So hearing no more comments, harvest prohibitions and fisheries. Again, remember that you've talked about the lack of evaluations, et cetera, but your knowledge from your uh, harvest uh, history and from the uh, uh, being out at sea all the time, et cetera, have the harvest prohibitions been a positive impact on fisheries? Fishers. I'm going to say yes. This is positive. It's a good word. And going back to the scoring. I would say positive also. And have they had a great impact on the fisheries or has they been medium? You've discussed the lack of evaluation, so that's a problem. I that that's the issue. I, I would say medium because we don't know, you know, it, it clearly stated in the SFA that a closed season or area closures can go either way. It can do something positive or it can do something negative. We know it did something positive for the red hind, but what is it, what is it doing for the rest of the species? We don't know that. So that's why I would say medium for right now. Okay. So would the same thing apply to the seasonal closures and the area closures? Yes. With yes. the same rationale that you yes. just expressed. Yes. 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 Okay. How about the uh, a, the trap fishery? You have a mesh size a regulations. You have a reduction program in place. You have escape vents, etc. So, would those trap regulations have had a positive impact on the fishery? Yes. And again, do you think still lacking evaluation of the fishery per se? Or would you think that the uh, traps up to date have had a high impact on the, on the fisheries? Meaning that you know, they allow for larger fish to be harvested and the little ones can escape, et cetera. Or you still think that evaluation is needed in this case? 
I, I, right now, I think the traps are built for what you want to catch. Some people target larger species. Some people target smaller blade mm -hmm. size species. It all depends. I think it's high. I think the the mesh size, the trap reduction plan. Um, I think it's had a very significant effect on a trap fishery. I totally agree. Okay. So hearing no other comments. So fisheries in general and recreational fisheries. Positive but low. This is Nicole Greer. I I can you explain a little bit more, mm -hmm. Graciela, what that line is about? So Leah, hi, do we have any comments on fisheries to recreational fisheries? Mm, hold on. We should. The, the main topic on your fisheries ecosystem model had to do with regulations. So are there fishery regulations that impact the recreational fishers? Some, um. not all. Is there a anything specific in, in the general fisheries regulations that have a positive or a negative impact on recreational fisheries? Once the recreational fishing license program, For example, mm -hmm. is it, once it's completed, um, that would be significant to the recreational fishery. So in this case, this low would be medium now because in fact, you can already get a, a recreational fishing license through the internet. Yeah, but you're not, there's, you're not, there's no official program and okay. there is no enforcement as far as compliance when it comes to the submission of data. So it's pretty much, you know, um, you know, up to the person desire, the level, you know, that they want to be compliant. So to me, it's, it's positive once the recreational license program goes into effect, that would be significant. Thank you, Ruth. Yep, those are all the reasons that it should have a low rating. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and Leah, hi, if there is anything that you need to mention when we go down this list, because we have eight more minutes here, market yeah. to commercial fisheries. Uh, the notes uh, just say that uh, the fisheries was uh, broken down into the recreational and commercial one. There was no other notes referring to them in that kind of connection, related to the connection. Okay. So what she's saying is that you have these things uh, doubled, basically, who can line to commercial fisheries, who can line to recreational fisheries, as a separate uh, unit. Correct. We still think that this should be divided among the two. And I'm, I'm asking all the members of the DAP. So should we keep this double? Yes. Okay. Yes. Having said that, how do you see what? each of these affecting the commercial and the recreational uh, fisheries and I don't think we have much more on the comments that you had been uh, making from the standpoint of the fisheries regulations right so there are no specific regulations regarding hook and line correct correct and would that be I mean, that would be okay. There is no problem with the way that the regulations are set up. Correct. Okay, so uh, having no who can line regulations, that's still a positive impact on the uh, commercial and recreational fishers. Yes. And would this be a lower, medium, or high impact, or? Medium. And that would be because? Would... Why 
Why would it be a medium impact? Well, it's just hard to say, like, if, the, if it's high or low. So I was basically just mm -hmm. saying medium. Okay. Yeah, I think medium would, would give you the, the, the room for clarification here coming up in the near future. So. Okay. And this would be the same for uh, recreational fishers also, right? Yeah. I believe so, correct? I Yes, I Julian, would. we're missing you. Is he back? Hello? Uh, I think we lost Julian. So I have a question for the group. I mean, we, we do have the regulations that apply to net diving, lobster, pelagics, etc. In the case of the net, I think that that's probably the one that it's the most significant. And I don't know if for St. Thomas, St. John, the net fishing has been uh, prohibited as it was in St. Croix. Off the top of my head. No, there's still a sane fishery in St. Thomas. Okay, so would these net and diving, lobster, pelagics, reef fish, et cetera, uh, the ones that deal with the uh, gear and the species, would they all be positive in terms of both commercial and recreational fishers? Or is there something specific about these connections that need to be different? I don't just, believe so. Okay, so if we go positive all the way to bait and medium all the way to and I need to talk to you about this last, we have three left. So market to commercial fishers, commercial fisheries. So one thing that fishers have always said is that the, the, uh, the market, it's really what drives the fisheries in the, the commercial fisheries in, in St. Thomas. Correct. Correct. So your market would have a positive impact on commercial fisheries because they would be targeting what's going to go to the market, correct? Yes, they would be positive and high. And high, okay. Maybe, and the last two, tourism to recreational fisheries and tourism to market. Let's, let's go back to bait. Can we go back to bait? Uh, certainly, yes. So here's bait. Do recreational fishers uh, buy the bait from the commercials or do they also go out to get their own bait? A lot of times they, they also go out to get, get their own bait. Actually, actually the Julian, you need to impact in the, the bait more than that. Um, Colin Butler for the record. Um, Recreational fisheries do buy bait from the commercial guys, like Ballyhoo, for example. But I also think the uh, recreational fisheries that do catch their own bait um, has a negative effect on some of the commercial guys that uh, rely on the same bait to uh, to fish. Um, uh, okay. Reason being, reason being is uh, there's a lot of recreational boats that fish all day long, seven days a week, sometimes twice a day, and uh, it's just. Um, Particularly Sprat, it's uh, it's it's taken uh, it's it's taken a beating, especially since this pandemic, because there's a lot of fishing going on right now as far as in the uh, the charter industry. It got a good break in the beginning of the in the in the beginning of the pandemic, but right now it's uh, it's getting hammered. I agree with Colin. I agree with Colin when it's specific to the Sprat for sure. There's also a negative effect when it comes to the net fishery because, like Colin said, the net guys go after the same bait that the recreational guys go after, and sometimes, you know, it doesn't always work well. Okay, so you're asking me to change that to negative for the recreational fisheries only. I would say yes, change it to negative. Okay. And you can put it a medium. I don't know how you guys feel about that. 
I agree with that. Colin Butler, for the record. I agree. Okay. So tourism has a positive impact on recreational fisheries. Yes. Yes. And that's a high. <laughs> that's a high. <laughs> that's a given. <laughs> and I would think that the same thing for a market. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, we have, Chairman, we have accomplished our mission today. This is not going to be the last time that you see this because now we have to go back to the scoring and come back to you and, and to the council. So we'll be preparing this for you for the uh, April 27th uh, meeting is a small summary of the work that has been accomplished. And uh, this is an evolving process. It will take a a little bit of time because as I said, there will be other groups looking to develop ec ecosystem conceptual models also. But I do want to thank you very much for uh, all your participation throughout all the meetings and especially for calling to the attention of the council uh, and the other uh, committees, the other groups that are working on this. The, the uh, real need to look at the uh, evaluation of the management measures that are in place. So that's already happening for the MPAs. You'll, you'll hear about it at the next council meeting. And uh, for bringing that to the table and really pushing to have that uh, looked at. So uh, having said that, I thank you again for all your uh, input. And if there are no other questions, you mission accomplished. <laughs> thank you, Graciela. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graciela. Well, well, thank Appreciate it. Well, Graciela, thank you for a great presentation and, and getting us through the process. I just say thank you to the team and all the, the people that participated in helping this to get completed. You know, it's, it's very important for everyone's involvement. And um, I feel a little bit more comfortable today that I had a lot more involvement with, um, with everyone today. So we need to just keep doing that and striving because it's, it's not my opinion all the time. It's it's everyone's opinion. So uh, thank you. And um, we have a meeting coming up in June. I will let you guys know more information about that. And um, thanks again. OK, that's you really right. You have to, to adjourn the meeting, stay the time and the day. Julian. Yeah, I lost I, I, the phone. <laughs> It continued transferring from my speaker back to the phone, and I, and then when I, it goes there, you know, yes, I'm here. So I entertain a motion for um to re uh, to adjourn the meeting. I second the motion, Lance Mon for the record. Uh, I need a motion. You only need a motion. You need a second. Just motion to adjourn. Okay. Yeah, just need a motion. Uh. uh Lance Mon for the record. Uh, I agree. Adjournment. All right. Thank you all again. So it's 12.04. Thank you very much, 12, Julian, for all the work. 12.04, meeting adjourned. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Miguel and Grace Yellow. Thank you.